Welcome to episode 8 of Coffee and Property. I'm David Hanna, this is Nicholas Charles, and today we're going to be discussing generational wealth, how you can avoid the shirt sleeve to shirt sleeves problem that occurs in many wealthy families. I told you I was going to do that, so <laughs> you're going to edit that out. Yeah. No, I'll leave that in. Uh, <laughs> Hi everybody and welcome to today's video, the episode 8 of Coffee and Property, and today we're going to be talking to Nicholas Charles of Charles Wealth about the second book in his series about wealth preservation and protection down the generations. And if you like this video, please click like and subscribe. You'll find links to the content of today's video in the links below, as well as a link to the fashion house of Maison Valendre, who have kindly lent us this location. Not often we get to shoot amongst haute couture, and that's a word I can't even get my lips round, but there we go. So we're here today to talk to Nicholas Charles about his series of books culminating in the latest title, Generational Wealth. Now, Nick, you've written these books because you became aware of the problem of what's called shirt sleeve to shirt sleeves. What exactly does that term mean? That essentially means um, as the generations pass, the first generation make it, the second generation save it, and the third generation tank it. And I've been personally affected by this with my own family dynamic. So my grandfather, uh, sorry, my great grandfather was a multimillionaire in his own right. But by the time my father was eight years of age, the wealth had completely gone. Um, this is back in Cyprus. And so when my father came to the UK, he came with literally the clothes on his back and nothing else and had to restart the wealth process from the very beginning. And now me growing up, listening to the stories of my father, I'm obviously worried in the back of my mind that I'm actually destined to lose everything. Right, okay, so basically you blame your father for you having to work for a living. Okay, it is good. Well, it's an, it's an interesting inspiration. I mean, what is wealth and, and why do families struggle to pass it on? Brilliant question. So the misassumption regarding wealth is that it's only, it only relates to financial capital. So we all know what financial capital is, property, um, business, um, stocks, shares, funds, all types of assets that are, are that predominantly form financial capital, financial wealth, but that's not wealth in its own right. So those families that focus purely on passing down the financial capital are the ones that tend to fail to retain it for multiple generations. Wealth in itself also involves things like human and intellectual capital as well as social capital. So it's the story behind the wealth. How did the money? How was the money made? Um, what, what, what was the story between behind father? Uh, mother or grandparents, what's the story behind the, um, the business itself? What does it mean on a social basis to have that surname? So the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds, for example, have got this sewn perfectly well. Um, the guy who wrote my, uh, my forward, Alexander Hoare, see Hoare and Co Bank, they've got this down to a T, which is why they've been around for more than 300 years, a private bank, 100 years more than the Rothschilds, I, I need to add. Um, so when you're passing down generational wealth, it's absolutely vital that you pass down not just the financial capital, but the education, the stories, the history, what I call the human, the intellectual and the social capital, because that will generate appreciation for the money. Mm -hmm. And that's vital if you want the next generation to be involved in ensuring that the wealth is retained for multiple generations. Yeah, I think we should probably interview Hoare and Co, because that's the first time I've ever heard the Rothschilds referred to as nouveau riche. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> so what you're saying is the single biggest mistake people make is having made it, they don't educate the next generations on how to maintain, improve on it in, in, in that sense. So. Yours is not a structural approach, if I might put it, but rather a systems approach to maintaining wealth and educating the next generations in how to deal with it. Yeah, essentially. So the, the problem with the professional industries, I call it, uh, so when I talk about the professional industry, that's accountants, my background, lawyers, financial advisors, wealth brokers, uh, bankers, etc., is that they're mainly focused on looking after the money. But who ends up blowing the money? It's the people. So what we decided when we looked at this and we, we created what I call uh, family prosperity, we looked at predominantly looking after the people. So we, right. we, turned the, we turned the system on its head and said, well, who needs to be looked after? It's the people. They need to be educated. They need to ensure that the communication systems are in place to ensure that when conflict arises, and that's the main reason why families fail, is due to conflict and not having the systems in place to deal with conflict, that those communications are had, so there's a structure in place for those families to deal with all the issues that are created through money. 
Mm -hmm. And conflict isn't necessarily a bad thing, by the way. Every family argues. There's no such thing as not having an argument with a family. I'm sure you're well aware of this. But it's how do you deal with that? How do you deal with those conversations? How do you deal with the argument as and when they arise? Mm -hmm. Do you have a system in place to fall back on and say, right, this is what we deal with. This is how we deal with conflict as a family. Or do you just go down the route of hope? Because once a family then goes into goes down the road of litigation, it's too late. The, the relationship is completely broken and the whole family the, will just implode. And you see this time and time again. It's irrespective of how much wealth is involved. I've seen uh, father and son divorce over one house. Over £2 billion a year is overpaid on stamp duty, with up to a quarter of purchasers paying the wrong amount. From millionaire developers to residential homeowners, anyone may be affected by these errors. Contact us today to see if you have overpaid your stamp duty and owed a refund from HMRC. Um, I've seen families implode over huge amounts of wealth. So the amount of money is not actually relevant per se. Mm -hmm. It's, there's a, there's a pot of capital. There's no systems in place. The family doesn't communicate about, uh, about the wealth or who's going to get the wealth or the gifting of the wealth. And that creates arguments which then spiral out of control. Mm -hmm. So this is actually the second book you've written. Generational yes. Wealth is the second book. The first book in the series was entitled? Uh, that was The Four Fundamentals of Family Prosperity. So that was like uh, an introducer to this whole um, story of, of family prosperity. What is it? What's involved? The actual reasons why families fail. So there was a big, um, there was like a 35-year piece of research that was done by Vic Prizer and Roy Williams. Mm -hmm. And they looked at 3,250 families over a 25 to 35-year period. And they uncovered the real reasons why families fail. So 60% failed because of um, poor communication. So poor communication leads to distrust. Distrust leads to conflict. Conflict leads to the family completely dissipating. 25% was because of uh, poor education. Um, so not educating the heirs to receive the capital. 15% was because um, there was no vision for the wealth. Mm -hmm. So they've created all this money and there was no, well, what do we do about it? And then the 5% was for what we classify as other reasons. Okay. And what did the professional industry focus on? The 5%, not the 95%, as I classify it. And so Generational Wealth, the second book, does, goes deeper and into more detail? Yeah, so when I was looking to write the second book, I wanted to create something with a bit more meat on the bone, as we say. I sourced a lady called Antoinette Proctor, who's my co-author in this particular book. She's a private wealth uh, lawyer. And it was just an idea in my head. I never, I've never, i got loads of ideas and it ended up creating this amazing book. So I interviewed her. I said, look, you've got a lot of intellectual capital. Let's get this on paper. Let's get this out of your head. Initially, it was like a 45 minute interview, very similar to this one. That interview actually lasted about two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to stop it in the end because there was just so much uh, content in place. We transcribed that book. We, sorry, we transcribed that interview and lots of content, didn't know what to do with it, it was quite raw. I ended up going to um, Dubai, I was a guest speaker at a Pristellan partner, specifically about generational wealth. Managed to get uh, COVID, which is not fun when you're out in Dubai because you can't leave the country if you've got COVID. Um, so I'm stuck in a room for 10 days and well, well I've got all this content, I might as, well, might as well make a book out of it. And that's how, that's how the book started, should we say. Okay, well, you, at least you managed to make some use of your some time day, while you were out there. Yeah. It's, uh, interesting. So, I'm curious because, of course, a lot of some people listening to this will go, "Oh, this is all incredibly complex," and you know, do I need to get involved in in building these processes? What's the one main tip you would give somebody to help protect their family well? Okay, so families, when when we talk about estate planning. The focus is, let's get a will in place, let's get some powers of attorney in place. Great. And I'll have, obviously, I'll tell every family to get those in place. But what's even more important than that is actually communicate the gifts before they're actually made. Because the problem with wills is they're only what I call one-way communication. And if you keep it hidden from your children or the next generation, whoever it is that you're making these gifts to, and, you, and they are unaware of what's being given and why it's being given, I can guarantee you that when you pass away, it's going to cause an absolute war within your family dynamic. Mm -hmm. You've worked so hard to run a business. And most family businesses, you know, you probably spend 30, 40, 50 years creating something out of nothing. You've probably got some investments on the side. 
Surely you do not want to see your family go to war over what you've effectively built. You want that to last for multiple generations. Mm -hmm. So spend the time and have those conversations with your family. Yes, they are emotional. Of course they are. They are difficult conversations, but you don't ignore them. Never, ever ignore them. And if you need help, bring someone like us to help mediate those conversations because they are difficult. I mean, I struggled to converse with my father about the world that he's going to leave behind. I've got two siblings. It's not an easy conversation to have mm. because at the end of the day, you're, you're talking about death and death is never an easy subject. But it's bigger than that. It's all about, well, let's retain the family dynamic for multiple generations because, like I said, wealth is much more than financial capital. Mm. But what causes the arguments is the financial capital that causes the, the arguments, which it, it causes the, the entire wealth and the relationships to dissipate and destroy themselves, which is, which is a shame. And no parent, I've never met a parent that wants their kids to argue or end up in court. Mm -hmm. But why does it happen? I agree. I mean, I, mean I'm, I'm, I must have educated my kids quite well because every time they see me and they say, how much is going, my inheritance <laughs> going to be? I mean, maybe they're just financially motivated. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's a complex situation. And, uh, you know, in terms of passing that wealth on and gifting, what strategies would you recommend that people do other than communicating and setting it up inside their will? It all starts. I mean, it's not as complicated as people envisage it being. Mm -hmm. they, 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 there's this misunderstanding of if, you know, that someone's going to perceive it the wrong way. You need to finally, first and foremost understand what are you giving? Yeah. What's the estate first and foremost? People don't even, un people don't spend the time to find out what it is that they're trying to give. So take a family business, for example. You, the, the biggest decision you'll ever make in the family business is exit. Are you going to exit or do you want the next generation to take over the family business? Mm -hmm. That's a conversation that you need to have with the next generation. Do they want it first and foremost? Um, are they interested in the business? Have they been involved in the business? Because taking over a business, you know, going from zero to CEO takes about, it's a five, 10 year process. Mm -hmm. It's not here are the keys to the business, good luck, my 21 year old son. I'm sure all the stakeholders will take you on no problem. Of course they won't. <laughs> they're, they're, you're gonna put, they're gonna, there's gonna cause arguments with all the stakeholders. So first and foremost, speak to your children or your grandkids or any other members, it might be nieces and nephews, and, and, and find out are they qualified to take over? Do they wanna take over? And if they don't, that's not a problem by the way. Mm. In that case, you're gonna to have to sell it and then you're gonna to have to pass the cash to the next generation. Mm -hmm. But it's not about just passing the cash over. Um, if you're worried about the next generation, you can control those gifts using trusts, for example. Mm -hmm. Sure, you're well aware of this being a, a <laughs> member of Cornerstone, you utilize m multiple um, structures like trusts and pensions. So if you wanna control how the capital is initiated and how it's treated, maybe you wanna only pass the income to the next generation and not the capital, again, Trusts are brilliant for that, so you've got an element of control post-death, shall we say, in mm. terms of how that money is treated. But make sure that there's, there is a vested interest in the capital, that they understand what they've been given to them, that you have a conversation with them so that they're fully aware what's been given to them before it's been gifted. And then you need to understand, do you want to give it during your lifetime or do you want to give, make gifts post-death? Yes, tax is important, don't get me wrong, but understand what you're giving first and then make it tax efficient. A lot of people go the other way around. They focus predominantly on the tax and then they say, by the way, children, this is what I've done, take it or leave it. And then they're wondering why that causes arguments amongst the family. Mm. Because the, the tax might be great, and I've seen this in the past, by the way, the tax plan is fantastic, but the children turn around and say, well, I, I didn't want this. <laughs> Why are you giving me this? Mm. I didn't want shares in the business. I wanted the cash. I wanted the property. I have, mm. no, ever, I have no interest in the company. Uh, great, I'm a paper millionaire, but I'd rather have the money, thank you very much. And that causes arguments again. So yeah, have the conversation first. Decide how you're going to make the gifts, who you're going to make the gifts to, whether you're going to make it during your lifetime or during death, and then make sure it's structured in the most tax efficient manner. Yeah, no, I, I think I would agree with you. I mean, in, in all the conversations we've had with clients about, I'll call it passing wealth, 90% of the discussion has been about control, has been about when and timing do we bring them in. Um, I love the idea that if you want to leave a business to somebody or multiple bodies in your family, you have to interview them for the job. 
to, A, to see whether they want the job and B, to see whether they're suitable. I've seen some pretty good family businesses over the last 40 years of my career where multi-generational businesses that were handed over even before death uh, and then subsequently wrecked yep. by the next generation because they didn't have a Scooby-Doo what was going on. Dad had always been the patriarch or, I mean, it might be a matriarch, but in, in this particular example, been a patriarch. He said, right, that's it, I'm off, lads. I'm going to go and sit in Malaga or Magaluf or wherever it was. And inside eight months, the business was in crisis because the three brothers that it had been left to, nobody had sorted out who was actually going to be MD, who was going to be in charge. The Very business drifted from lack of leadership and lack of decisions because Dad had always taken the decision. Yep. And you can only have one CEO in any business. Correct. Make so, the decision who's going to be the leader, whether it's the... The next gen who make that decision, and I've seen it time and time again that they they're actually the best people to decide sometimes, mm -hmm. or make the decision yourself, and just say I'm going to make you the leader, and these are the reasons why, and because and you're so, the best and qualified, and be there to, ha to as part of the handover process. Yeah, because they will need your expertise. If you if you've known the business and you've grown it from scratch, why run away? Um, a really good example of this is uh, uh, Reed and Co. Um, the, the job finding agency, mm -hmm. well, they're absolutely huge. Um, family run business still, um, that's still around, but he's there uh, in, the, in the background as a consultant. And his son loves it because every time he has a problem or a question, Dad. he can turn around to the father and say, how would you solve this? Mm. And it's, you know, how many years of expert, you can't buy that level of expertise. You no. can't buy that experience. So be around and mm. share what I call all the wealth with the next generation is a classic example of it. Yeah, I mean, it's a classic approach. I mean, as you know, I've gone back to chairman of Cornstown Group and, and ceased doing the day-to-day. -day. And I've, interestingly, I, I adopted a different leadership strategy, which was to bring in or promote for internally somebody who is not in the family. Because I sometimes believe that you need a, what's called a buffer leader between the outgoing father and the next generation because sometimes that next generation isn't yet old enough or experienced enough they can't command respect but what's really interesting is is that the role i've adopted with everybody in the organization is exactly that organization there you go i think you know but if you're not sure just call me <laughs> you know i'm here to answer those questions that you can't find the answer to and you know just feel free to call me whenever you've got a problem um, and by the way, if I think you've got a problem, I'll be calling you. <laughs> you know, it's a bit of a big daddy kind of thing, but that's but whether you're involving your family in a business, a properly run business, that is the role of the leader and the managing director and the chairman. They're to be there to mentor and support and enable their staff, whether they're related to them or not. I mean, that's just good management, isn't it? Yeah, of course. And you use the same dynamics within the family um, um, system, the family situation as well. Mm. Have someone to mentor the next generation. Um, whether it's yourself, or whether you bring an external mentor, it's absolutely vital. They need to be educated. There's no point handing over. I say this so many times, go, just imagine you're 21 years of age, you just come out of university, and someone that you've never met before, a, you know, a trustee, hands over a cheque for 10 million pounds. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do? You know nothing at that stage of your life, but you, you're a multi-millionaire now. You have no reason to work. It, mo it destroys ambition, and it, will, and it will drive you insane. What are you gonna, you're gonna spend it on, you know, Fast cars, fast women, fast men, maybe. Um, and you're just going to blow it. And, you, and, and it's going to absolutely... And you see it time and time again. Don't need to rely on me. Just do the research. Go Google how many children have blown the wealth, either mm. you know, up their nose or, or they tend to um, have you know, you know, addictions to, because they've got no purpose in their life. And why have they got no purpose in their life? Because mother, father, hand over a blank check to them. Yeah. And it can destroy, and it destroyed, I mean, a great example I use is the Vanderbilt family. So Cornelius Vanderbilt, turn of the 19th century, the richest man in the world. Sorry, turn of the 20th century, he was the richest man in the world when he passed away. He was, depending on the time value of money, worth over about $100 billion at the time. Within less than 100 years, I think the family met in 1963, collectively, there wasn't a single millionaire amongst the family. There wasn't a single millionaire amongst the family, and why? because they treated the wealth as a curse. I think one of the grandchildren came up with a brilliant quote, because it, it destroyed all my happiness. Uh, inherited wealth is to ambition what cocaine is to morality. Mm -hmm. 
It's a brilliant quote. And they treated, they treated the wealth as a cancer. So what do you do with cancer? You've got to get rid of it as quick as possible. Mm. And they succeeded. They got rid of all the money very, very quickly because, they, because no one taught them that no one taught them how to be, how to appreciate that money and mm. how to use the money and how to, tr and how to even the, the, the family name was a burden for mm. the Vanderbilts because they'll assume they, everyone has treated them as royalty and they, they still are royalty if you go around the United States. Most of the buildings are named after the Vanderbilts, but it's not a millionaire amongst the family. It's, yeah, it, it, it's, I suppose you're, what you're saying here, this is why it is essential for a family to appoint a, a professional power team. Yes, vital, essential. I mean, there's this funky saying now, family office. It's being branded all over the place. Let's have a family office. Wait, <laughs> put the structures and the governance in place first. If you want a family office, a family office, a, a genuine family office has governance structures in place. Mm -hmm. And you treat a family office like you would treat any business. So mm -hmm. I say, with, with a business, you have a board of directors. Well, why do you have a board of directors? Because they each has their own roles and responsibilities to ensure the vision and the mission of the business are met. Well, if you're gonna run a family office, it starts with a vision first. <laughs> what is the vision for the wealth? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to achieve in this world? Mm -hmm. um, do you want generational wealth as part of the family's vision or do you wanna just give the whole lot to charity? There's no right or wrong, by the way, and everyone's completely different. Okay, that's the first step. The next step is, well, what are the roles and um, processes in place that you're going to assign to the family dynamic? Who's going to take responsibility for setting up the professional power team, mm -hmm. if anyone? Because in the day, someone needs to converse with the power team and make sure they converse in a way that they're clear on what they, what they want. So there's some clarity involved. What are you trying, you know, at the end of the day, the, the power team are great in their own right. But one, you have to formalize the power team. You have to create a sense of trust within the power team. And you have to speak regularly with the power team so that they know what it is that you want them to do. There's no point going, I've met so many lawyers about this, whereby they said, I wish my client had told me what they actually wanted 12 months ago and my advice, my goodness, would have been completely different. <laughs> but they had to find out along the way because the client never knew what they wanted. Yes. They go to a lawyer, they go to a, you know, a trust accountant, I think I need X. No, you don't. <laughs> Sit down and focus on the problem. What is it? What are you trying to achieve? And then create the power team to help you get there. It's a business plan, essentially, isn't yeah, it? It's a it vision. Is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it starts with a vision, and then it and then it's a working, like almost a working machine. It's not something you just you create the vision, put it in the drawer, and then hope for the best. Yet a lot of families that I see, especially those that fail, use hope as a strategy for their generational plan. Like you never use hope to run a successful business. So why using hope for your family? It's terrible. I would never advise it in a million years, but you've created this bulk of wealth, 20, 50, 100 plus million pounds, dollars, euros. That in itself is a business, but I call it the business of being a family. Mm -hmm. And it requires um, uh, roles and, and huge amount of responsibility to ensure that wealth is not only sustained within the family dynamic, but is grown within the family over multiple generations. And that's what the, you know, the Waltons have done successfully, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the, the, the Hawes, um, all, all have done this for a reason. They, they all got the systems in place. They all aspire to a certain set of values. They've all got governance structures. They've all got these similar common traits, even though they're completely different because mm. every family is completely different, mm -hmm. but they all have their similarities in place. I, it's interesting you say values because, of course, there's a perception of the wealthy as being just greedy profit takers and, you yeah, know... Huge misconception. You, you're saying that each of these successful families has almost its own st set of standards of morality and morality and moral code? Well, they have to. They have to, otherwise they, they won't survive for multiple generations because these are the values that are then given to the next generation. This is what it means to be a Charles, a Rockefeller, a Rothschild, a Walter. This is what it means to, to be this. And this is what we expect from you. It's not about just giving them wealth. It's about passing over all the wealth to the next generation, which is what's talking about the social capital, um, the meaning behind the name, the, you know, the brand. And this is what we expect from you when you represent us, when you go out to the public. And presumably an underpinning of that is here's the basic essential values of being a moral human being. Mm -hmm. Of course. Interesting. So in, the, in, in whatever that 
is for that particular family because every family is completely different. But you say, I mean, it's funny that you say that, you know, that this misconception over the wealthy. Who are the biggest donors to charity? The wealthy. It's the wealthy. Who are the, you know, who are the ones, who are the movers and the shakers on this planet? Who are the ones who are aspiring to make a huge difference to this world that we live in today? It's, it's the Elon Musks of the world that are making a huge difference. Yes, they're unbelievably wealthy, but, let, but they're using their wealth for good. They're not just evil. Of course, they're imperfect. Don't get me wrong. Everyone's imperfect. I don't, you know, let's not put them on a pedestal by any stretch of the imagination. But don't have this misconception that you are wealthy, therefore you must be evil. It's completely crap. And yet, yet there is this populist perception that of all wealth is evil and is derived from this. I mean, you know, by the way, if I ever put tried to put Elon Musk on a pedestal, he'd probably add nine rocket engines <laughs> to the bottom and launch himself into orbit again. But, uh, you know, we're seeing this consistently, aren't we? You know, um, Bill Gates, Microsoft, you know, donated, I think, nearly all or all of his wealth to the Gates Foundation, which yep. has been an, an enabling organization in many areas not least during the pandemic of course and so you know it's wrong to argue that wealth is evil I think wealth like anything can be used for evil but the creation of wealth and the creation of jobs and I think the other thing is is the public perception about what the true measure of wealth is if you're worth 10 billion it doesn't mean that you've got a very large room down at Horan Co where you've got it stacked up in 50 pound notes that's how the market values your companies yeah. and your shares and that reflects on things that's often a misunderstanding you know let's tax the wealthy well actually they're probably not as cash rich as you like to think they are it's a big thing with me and wealth taxes well how are you going to collect it because these people don't have that cash but on another way and you've kind of we've kind of got this but just get back to this on you know we talked about social capital and when we talked about investment strategies how do you invest in family members well, what what are the investments you can make in family members well first and foremost the number one investment is education right educate them in whatever field that they want to perceive pursue shall we say um, whether it's in the family business or whether it's in their own journey and ensure that every family member is given the right to access their own individual path to happiness. So there's not that, there's no point pushing your values onto the next generation because they'll just push back. Mm -hmm. You have to listen to the next generation. Mm -hmm. You have to understand and appreciate whatever their values are and support them in any way you can. Because that, that will change over time. You know, the next entrepreneur for the family might be the so-called black sheep of the family who doesn't want to go to university. Well, but they, they, but, they generally tend to be. Just look at recent you know, the history of the last 30 years and you know that it's mostly dropouts or non-university yeah. people who've been successful entrepreneurs. Exactly. I mean, we could probably shoot another entire two <laughs> hours on what makes a great entrepreneur and, of course. and a great leader in business. But, I mean, what you seem to be saying is, is that you don't shove them all through Eton or Millfield and then send them off to a Swiss finishing school and no, Gestalt of course not. And stuff like well, look, that. Look, unless they want to do that. Yeah. You, you, you know, you that's give, not, that's you, not a bad thing either. So let's not criticise those family members who have gone to Eton by any stretch of the imagination. Oh, I'm not. But you have to ask them what do they want to do and make sure that they're clear on what they, whatever they path they want to follow, that they will be supported. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they should also be told they're not going to be given a blank check because that is destructive to the next generation. Yes, you'll support them, but you'll support them in whatever endeavors they have. I mean, look, if, once you get to a certain amount of wealth, you can have what, what we call a family bank. And that family bank is set up in place to support education and the next business idea that the next generation may or may not have. So again, it must be approached well, in a way that you treat any bank. Was you, that not true of Elon Musk? Did he not take borrow money from his father to start his companies or was that I, something I've heard that was apocryphal that he was uh, yes he did successfully drop out of university and, and build his first app but apparently you know, the rumor is he did it because his father South African father was wealthy and I'm not sure if his there's a uh, he had a very unusual relationship with his father um, he doesn't speak very highly of his father it's quite a touchy subject about because his father beat his mother 
Um, so I'm apologies not... to Elon Musk, by yeah. the way. <laughs> Nick McLean knows a lot more about the family history than I do. Um, so I'm not sure if the if he did support. I don't think he did. I'll be honest with you. Uh, Bill Gates was supported by his dad, though. Mm -hmm. Bill Gates was supported by his father to start his um, to start his business albeit in, in the back of the, the, the family garage, and look where Microsoft is today. Mm. I mean, we recently um, did some research on this for a, for a short YouTube video on our channel. It's sort of like, you know, how, how to start a small business from home, how to earn passive income from your property. And we researched how many successful businesses have been started in garages. Um, and Google, what, another one. <laughs> They've done no, right. Microsoft and Google, but what was really interesting was Harley Davidson motorcycles were started in a garage around the turn of the last century. Um, Nike was started in the basement. Nike in a basement. So you don't have to have millions in capital and thousands no. of square feet to get, you know. To, to you just a need a great idea. You need to be able to so find a problem that's big enough that needs to be solved, that hasn't mm -hmm. been solved so far. And that's pretty much the foundation of every successful business that's out there. Yeah. And, and, and now we've got access to almost infinite information. Uh, all you need essentially to start a business is a laptop and internet connection. Yeah. <laughs> it's never been easier, I'll be honest with you. It's, it's never been easier to certainly get, get, get your idea out to the world. Unfortunately, as we both know, it's never therefore never been easier to have your idea copied by somebody yeah, else of course. almost overnight. Just make sure you're the best at it. Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I think oh, thank you so much. I would recommend these books to anybody. And certainly the first book, you really ought to read these. Even if you haven't made your millions yet, get to understand how successful families operate. Because what you're saying here, if I get the, the gist right, is successful families are all about successful businesses. They're the same thing. It's about system. It's about organization. It's about not management, but vision and, and, and philosophy. And that's something I can echo quite strongly. Well, thank you very much for thank you very much. coming today. Thank you again to Maison Valendra. Um, I've been David Hanna for Cornerstone Tax SDLT Refunds. If you want to know more about preserving your wealth by getting a refund of the overpaid SDLT or making sure you don't overpay on your next transaction, please click on the link below. Links also to both of Nick's excellent books and to some other resources. And we'll talk to you on the next episode of Coffee and Property. Thanks for listening. Thanks.